Oh, hello and welcome, welcome to everybody who's joining us from across America and internationally. I know that we have many, many attendees. We're grateful and humbled that you are here with us. It's award season <laughs> and we are honored and grateful. Speaking of honor and grateful to have these fabulous, insightful conversations with some of Hollywood's top costume designers for our FIDM lecture series. I'm Nick Varios and I'm co-chair of the FIDM fashion design department, as well as film and TV costume design and theater costumes design. So once again, thank you, thank you for joining us. I think we're gonna have, have a wonderful conversation. Mark Bridges, Mark Bridges, so amazing and such a wonderful, wonderful human being and talented costume designer. Let me give a little bit of an introduction to Mr. Mark Bridges, costume designer of Views of the World. Born and raised in Niagara Falls, New York, Mark received a Bachelor's of Arts degree in theater arts from Stony Brook University. He then worked at the legendary Barbara Matera Costumes in New York City as a shopper for a wide range of Broadway, dance, and film projects. Following his time at Matera's, he received a Master's of Fine Arts degree in costume design from NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. In 1989, he relocated to Los Angeles to be assistant costume designer to the Honorable Richard Hornung on The Grifters in 1990, Barton Fink in 1991, Doc Hollywood in 1991 as well, and Nixon in 1995, as well as many others. In 1995, Mark began his costume design collaboration with Paul Thomas Anderson, designing Heart Eight, AKA Sydney, in 1996, Boogie Nights, in 1997, Magnolia in 1999, and There Will Be Blood in 2008, starring the Daniel Day Lewis. Mark's seventh collaboration with Paul Thomas Anderson's Inherent Vice in 2014 resulted in Mark receiving an Oscar nomination for Best Costume Design. In 2012, Mark won an Academy Award, a BAFTA and People's Choice Award for his costume design for the artist. His second Academy Award for best costume design, yes, second, came in 2017 for his costumes in Phantom Thread, the story of a London couturier starring Daniel Day-Lewis. All in all, he has been nominated four times and won twice. His varied costume designs have been seen in other films, including Fifty Shades of Grey, Captain Phillips, Jason Bourne, and Joker of course, which costumes were featured at our FIDM's Museum Annual Art of Motion Picture Costume Design Exhibition right here at FIDM. And now we are honored with his costume designs once again with his first Western News of the World starring Tom Hanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mark Bridges. Hello. <laughs> Nick, hi. Hi, there's Mark. Hello. Hi. Everybody, welcome Mark Bridges. Woo, yay. <laughs> yeah. I just dropped off there for a second, sorry. Uh, yes, no, 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 no worries, no worries. I bet you were doing something with those beautiful flowers next to you. No, nope, they're good. <laughs> <laughs> they're okay. They're good. Okay. It, was, it was the internet that was the problem. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, um, we, we're so honored to have you. And I'm so happy because, you know, during all our years doing the exhibition, the Art of uh, Motion Picture Costume Exhibition, you've always been such a, um, a, an amazing guest. And it's always been, every time I see you, I just want to go like, you know, bow down because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's always, always a great joy to have somebody who's, who's so passionate for his work and, and so wonderful to talk about your work and your designs, your costumes. So um, just, just a general honor to have you uh, with us. So thank you so much. Are you here in Los Angeles, Mark? Yeah, I am. I'm just 
here enjoying the weather. Uh, regrouping, recharging. I finished a film in November and uh, I, I usually like to balance it with take as much time off that, uh, that I worked. Yeah. Um, you know, so that it makes me want to get back out there again, you know? Right. So recharging. Recharge. I like, I like that. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, I'm glad you're well and staying safe during these times. I hope every, you know, we will all get through this. We will all get better. Um, and um, I, speaking for many people, we are very thankful to have, uh, to get to see your work during these times that we could just be home and watch movies and, and, and you know, take us, take us somewhere else. <laughs> Take us somewhere else. 1870s Texas. Thank you. This it's year, good segue. Good. I'm happy to be part. I'm so proud to be part of that movie. I, I love that director. Tom's great. You know, uh, it, 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 I'm just proud of it. Uh, my third collaboration with Paul Greengrass, second with Tom, uh, first Western which I didn't even think was a Western when I was reading it. I, it's <laughs> a beautiful story that I wanted to do justice to. And then suddenly it be, got referred to in the press and things as a, a Western. A Western. Like, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, okay. And then, and then the fact that, wait, it's Mark Bridges' first Western. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I Let's think Tom a, Hanks' first Western, too. Oh, really. interesting. Okay, yeah, so yeah. a first for several of you. Let's give a brief synopsis um, for people. You know, News of the World is set at, um, just after the Civil War and stars Tom Hanks as Captain Jefferson Kidd as a former Confederate soldier uh, who's escorting an orphaned girl played by German actress uh, Helena Zengel back to her family. Tom Hanks' character earns his living reading the top newspaper stories from town to town in the South. Therefore, the title of the movie. I don't think I've, uh, you know, I've given, it's just a brief synopsis, I haven't given everything away. So you still, if you haven't seen it, please um, go see it. Uh, wonderful story, gorgeous costumes. You, it just takes you there. Uh, the soundtrack, which I'm sure you heard a little bit of it in our intro is, is sweeping, just um, like the music. So again, your first Western, Let's talk about these, um, the costumes first. I wanna know, how do, you, how do you approach a project such as this? Like you said, you first read it, you didn't really think it was a Western, but how, take us through your process of, of starting a project of this proportion. Right, you know, uh, a lot of times uh, I've been fortunate enough to do films that were based on a book. Uh, this was Paulette Giles' novel. Um, I've done Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, Inherent Vice, Inherent Vice right? Thomas Pinchon novel, um, you know, and even Silver Linings Playbook was a book, you know. So, and sometimes you want to read the book, oh, and sometimes you know the director will say just read the script. Interesting. Oh wow. Um, so okay. this one, I I just. I found it very helpful on Inherent Vice to see what was on Pinchon's mind. And also Paulette Giles gave me some hints and ideas of how to maybe approach this. Um, that, that Mexican poncho that she wears is something that's mentioned in the book. And I thought, mm. oh yeah, we've got to have that because it's, it made sense to be practical in something he'd have in the wagon, you know, so. Right. Um, you know, uh, but also he just put up on the screen some of my tear sheets on how I start. So I look at, I start to look at research and think about like, okay, what, what did the Kiowa wear? And, you know, you'll find images of a garment. Of course, it's 150 years old garment, but, you know, we we're dealing with the new. Um, it's interesting to have these young girls in the, the uh, uh, Native American dress here and, and, uh, it, it also, kid, you know, he's trying to present himself very uh, stately, and right. uh, so I, I went into some people who were in government or people of authority in small towns. Um, I think Paul Greengrass feels like uh, 
he really has his roots in these itinerant preachers uh, that were mm. very common in England, but also here in America. So, uh, but I, I also think it's a show. So we wanted him to uh, put on something, you know, as a as a kind of a costume for his performance. And then, right, um, right, we have kid traveling, so we want to get a sense of what that world is like the period the worn the road worn look of what he wears um shapes the height of the boot the height of the trousers maybe some garments i think the top left one right above kid traveling was something that paul greengrass really responded to to uh you know as as a look we didn't copy it exactly but you know there's always like dna of things that then you take the ball and run with it so to speak so we had fabric woven for his traveling outfit for trousers for jacket um because we needed a lot of it and i wanted it to have that handmade feel right um, you know just trying to source fabrics the deer skin for her Kiowa dress was tanned for us in Florida um, and the color was made by how much they smoked wood smoked mm. it. and so for a while there we would get open up the cage where the costumes were or the fabrics were and they'd hit by this wall of wood smoke you know wow um, yeah wow. so so <laughs> that was all new to me all very very new to me and uh really really interesting really interesting. that's that's great i love i love the mood board i'm always a big fan of the mood board and i know you know at fidm we have our our wonderful fabulous our fidm film and tv costume uh program and i know that we spend a lot of time with um you know talking about the importance of research and i know how important research obviously to you is and you can just see it in your in your mood boards and your storyboards are there times when, for example, for the director, do you show those inspiration boards, those mood boards, and and like you, I think you briefly touched on it. Does does the director go, I I I think let's go more in that what that photo is telling us. I, that is sometimes the case, you know, but it's very narrow. I mean, I present something like my point of view, and it's very narrow, like uh, you know. Well, these you already saw, but the mood boards, when you when you go back to those mood boards, um, it's it's not a big, there's not a big variety there. It's not mm -hmm. all over the place. It's like, basically, it could be this, or it could be this. And we're all looking at the same thing. Uh, uh, if we weren't going to go like this, you know, I would have to be... <laughs> I mean, there are parameters. There's 1870s is a parameter. Got uh, it. Right, right. I was a parameter. Uh, but then you can you can be a little like there is creative freedom in in terms of putting you know your Mark Bridges touch to within those parameters, right? I guess that is a job when you're when you work as a costume designer when you're working for period where there are certain parameters such as the the time frame and what you know, the people actually wore during that time frame, but then, then there's that, you know, that question mark. Yeah, then there's, you know, fabric choices, there's cut, there's, you know, the shape of things, you know, I'm constantly working with the makers of these costumes all the time, you know, getting proportion right, or where the pockets are on his traveling coat, or where we did, we got a really interesting prototype of a of a frock coat for him for the black and where the seams were in where the that seam that, that is so mark let me tell you i, I thank you because mm -hmm. uh, as a fashion designer and i watch movies i'm always looking at the details and i have another one i'll bring up a little bit later but that's one of the details that i know when i was watching news of the world i was i was fixated every time there were close-ups with him in the frock coat in that shoulder, that that frock coat shoulder seam that that goes to the back, yeah. Um, and and I, you know, it, it almost was like, yes, that's that's how it is. Good, you know, good. I I knew Mark would 
go you know, like that was like check <laughs> yeah but it, and it's choices like that that you know let, let me have my creativity there's also the slimness of the sleeve you know i choose all the fabrics um you know i knew that i wanted a, a black brocade for the waistcoat um uh, you know we found something we had it dyed you know you're choosing everything you're choosing you know we got this kind of wax linen polished linen from england for the back mm. of the waistcoats and you know there was a tiny tiny little piping a, a green piping along the lapels of his jacket actually yeah so that was what was on the prototype. We thought it was so unique. I'm, I'm just constantly making these decisions to try to be really specific about the period or make it interesting to look at. Um, even though it's very simple, I think they all put together, they, it makes an interesting garment and it makes it feel like you're in a different time because you don't see any of that now. Right, right. And, and also, it just seems seamless. It really, it doesn't take away from the story. It just becomes part of the story. It, it Like I said, I feel like I, I, I was one of those, you know, attendees listening to him, watching and listening to him right then and there, you know, reading the, the, the news of the world. Um, and I thought that that was, you know, that was beautiful. Um, obviously, you, for all the principles, the costumes were all made, right? They were all custom made. Yes. Because we needed, you know, the practical aspect of filmmaking, you know, Tom had stunt doubles and photo doubles mm -hmm. and so did uh, an 11 year old typically has a stunt double and a photo double, but then, you know, there's so much action and everything. So, you know, uh, she had a, an excellent photo stunt double and an excellent photo double too. So, but we, you know, they couldn't be one-offs like I usually right. like to use. Um, this really had to be made from the ground up. And see, even on this little shoulder of Helena's, there's a tiny little piping right there. And, yeah, I, um, let's talk about, let's talk about some of the individual. Let's start, since we have Helena up here, um, for her character. Yeah, that's, it, that's, this is another thing I focused in was the drop shoulder on uh, her traveling dress. And then all of a sudden I looked up close to your, that photo that mm -hmm. you have, and there it is. Yeah. Um, and was that the provenance of it? Because I thought it was so unusual. The fact that the shoulder was dropped, it didn't really fit her per se, but maybe, you know, that this was part of that, that period of like those, you know, little girls dresses. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, you also, you know, I'm designing for the story. And the, and the story is that, she, you know, we don't know where uh, this woman got this dress. There's some kind of hand-me-down, maybe from one right. of the LA students or something. So the fit, you know, it's, it's kind of a challenge to make it seem like it's a hand-me-down, but also uh, it looks decent on her. <laughs> you don't want it to be terribly baggy, but it, I mean, she's pretty typical size for an 11 year old girl. Right. So, um, you know, I'm thinking, of, okay, what would it be that, you know, what is she able to get, Doris is able to get, and how is it gonna fit her for the long run? You know, I did details on the dress, like the tucks and the skirt, because that's pretty, all the way through all the research of these uh, period photographs, there's tucks at the bottom of the skirt. So as the person grew, you could let out the tucks. Oh, and interesting. They could spread out, you could longer. let them out. Yeah, so you got a lot of, you got a lot of life out of one garment. You know, you <laughs> oh, had... I didn't even think about that. I always think of tucks uh, as sort of just a detail, especially for little girls' dresses. You know, the little detail, whether it's horizontal tucks or, or you know, uh, vertical tucks. Um, yeah. I just think of those little mini pleats as a detail of, of children's dresses, but I understand now that it's actually practical. <laughs> yeah, if you had like three daughters or something, you know, they could all all wear them depending <laughs> on the age and their height and everything. So so I thought that was a cool uh, de detail. Um, and this shape of dress is pretty typical. Uh, 
not a lot of, you know, it's just simply gathered into a waistband in the front, right. a tiny bit of trim at the neck. Um, the biggest problem we had was uh, finding enough of this fabric um, mm. because it's kind of like uh, they kind of remake Civil War pattern calicos for quilters. Mm -hmm. but, but typically quilters only have a couple of yards because people only need pieces. That's right? all they need, right. So I think uh, my assistant designer sourced enough fabric from about eight vendors to, be able to get enough yardage to make all the dresses that we needed. So yeah, sourcing sometimes is difficult. And then I also thought she needed this little woolen dress uh, this jacket, this little the jacket, jacket right. that I made with some velvet trim and there's a little a soutache edging on it. And it doesn't quite match, but it does work, you know? And um, I just love the little boxy shape of it. And she loses it at some point, but uh, it it's, I wanted it to be a contrast from mm -hmm. what we first see her in to coming around to wearing Western, I mean, American, I'm not sure. <laughs> right, right, right. And where did you get, uh, where did you get the poncho? Where or did you have that made? Yeah, we had it. I, you know, it's the kind of thing, you know, I love the internet because, you know, you just <laughs> Wait, put it. I, I think, Please, I think everybody the, always caught, well, did you find it on Etsy? <laughs> no, the other blanket though, that she goes into Dallas, that was on Etsy. Oh. Okay. I love that blanket so much and it, it was a find, but uh, this was, um, it's, I think how you pronounce it is Hirongo. It's like a poncho and it's okay. in the book. It's in the mm -hmm. book. Um, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing it right. Um, but, and they have on Facebook, there's a place and you look that word up and it came up a Facebook site that will weave them for you. Wow. So we had doubles made for that and then uh, broken down and everything. But so, you know, it's it's fantastic to just be able to, I remember a time when you were, things weren't that easy to, to <laughs> find, you know, and we were very, I feel we were very fortunate too, to be able to find someone, they worked with us, they did our time frame, uh, really communicative. They took credit cards. We were <laughs> the place in Mexico, and uh, you know we had no problem. I made a couple of different colorways uh, because I wasn't sure, but I I always feel like simple is better and less eye catching is better. There's a lot of contrast in that, but at least it's kind of a neutral color. It was great because they're sitting, you know, there, and it 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 you know you. It was a great way to bring the interest to the three quarter shot when we see them both sitting there and then she she wraps she has the poncho wrapped on it just adds it adds something to the you know I wouldn't say it's a statement making necklace uh, per se but it was it, you know it it added like it, first of all it's practical you know she has to you know she wants to stay warm and and be you know covered from the elements but at the same time it added a nice. Uh, it was great for the frame, you know, of the shot. So um, now just a reminder to all our attendees, we have Q&A, you can ask your questions. So make sure to submit your questions and uh, towards the end around 5.45, 50 minutes uh, to end time, we'll, we'll start answering some of your questions. Let's get to, uh, let's talk a little bit about Tom Hanks's reading look. I know we talked about it a little bit, um, how you talked that made, you know, in, possibly inspired by preachers. It was sort of a costume. You know, it's his, he put on this costume to read and it's obviously, it's his dressed up suit. Um, I, I, another detail that I loved Mark was, I think there's a, there's a scene where there's a close up shot of his sleeve. And I think you have, you guys, if you haven't watched the movie, pay attention. It, you, you, the, the, the camera comes close to the, to his cuff in his white shirt and the gathering on that shirt mark is exquisite. And it looks like it was, it, it was like hand gathered, you know, like it, it would be, you know, if it wasn't made by machine. But I thought that I was such a, a um, it just showed elegance 
the de the little details, and especially with men's where we all know it's about the details. And like you were talking about little hidden details in this suit, but um, I love, I have to tell you, I just love the, the, the delicacy and precision of, of the gathering. It almost mimicked his, his precision when he reads the news of the world and how, how delicate he reads it, how precise he reads it. It, it sort of, it, it mirrored that to me. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. This was made by, I'm pretty sure those shirts were made by my favorite shirt maker, Anto Beverly Hills, who I've been working oh. with for 30 years. Wow. They do period for me. And they do, you know, they're just quick. I mean, even when I was working in England, it was faster for me to get them from here, shirts made wow. from here, than it was to get them made in England. Because you tell them your time frame, and they would be like, you want it when? What? <laughs> um, so, but whereas Anto does, a hundred films a year and you know knows we're always under the gun so that's why there's all that detail you know i went back and forth should i do silk should i do just a textured fabric i i also i think his stuff is is a little earlier like he's had it for like 20 years mm. um uh stuffed in a saddle bag you know right it's hard, it's hard to make silk look rumply and bad it, it always kind of <laughs> looks good he's throwing that shirt on you know unless it's a china silk that's gonna crack or something i mean so he looks good and presentable and it's his one good shirt and it's his one good vest and he's had them for 20 years right and uh you know brushes them out before his performance or whatever um you know you're just I look at all the details because you never know what the camera's going to see. I typically mm -hmm. don't use black like in films. I, I, it's an old thing of like feeling like it leaves a big hole. You know, that's, I don't typically use black. There's always like some tooth to it. This happens to be kind of a darkly lit film. So, you know, luckily the white shirt makes you see Tom Hanks, but um. right, it pops, it pops out. Did you have any? Um, I think I read that you that you didn't, but I mean, yeah, I, maybe I was wrong. Did 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 you have any pre fittings, or did he just did he? Uh, I'm sure I know he's a busy man, perhaps. And did you do the costumes, and he showed up? I know you've worked with him. That's how. For that, that's how we did it. That's how we did it this time. He was unavailable to us until about three weeks before shooting. Mm -hmm. So, in, you know, uh, I had no choice. I mean, you have to just be brave about your, I had the director sign off on what we were doing. I'd worked with Tom before and I had my first fitting things made so that, uh, we could alter them and we'd be able to shoot on time. At least one, <laughs> one set of clothes. Right. Um, fortunate that we also didn't get Helena from Germany until uh, just a little tiny bit before that either. So, mm. you know, but I have Paul's blessing on what I'm going to do so and he signed off on the fabrics and I sent him you know swatches to England where he was and he signed off on everything so I'm just going for it you just right, have to right. go for it you can't there's no way to whiffle you know waffle back waffle and forth. right <laughs> you know like there's no no uh time to be scared about anything just go for it just go for and, it just go oh, here for we it. are having a good time on the set <laughs> And you filmed in New Mexico, is that right? That's right, in the area of Santa Fe. And, nice, uh, nice. Yeah, it was really beautiful. The nature there is unbelievable. I'd not worked there before. And uh, I, I enjoyed my time there, I really did. And I worked with a lot of great people in my department. Um, I think I only brought my assistant, my supervisor. The rest of the people were from Locally, there's a lot of film work in Albuquerque. So a lot of them came from there, but very professional. Some of them had worked with Tom before. Um, it was great, great group. Just a great group. We, Wonderful. Uh, there, 
the space we had to work out of, we were sure to get all our steps in. It was formerly a casino that was empty and they gave it to us for costumes. Wow. And then they built something out and back and they used other parts of it for parts of sets and things. But yeah, yeah, we we got our steps in and the whole industrial kitchen was like the dye room breakdown room. <laughs> Was the kitchen of the casino was your your dive dive work room. Dye work yeah. room. Uh -huh. It was great. <laughs> talk um, briefly. Talk about. I know you have a story about uh, a hat and Tom Hanks and a hat. This hat that you made and yeah. you didn't know whether he would wear it. Um, yeah, tell yeah, us it's, quickly it's just, what what happened. What happened? Um, you know, uh, because of the truncated time working with Tom, you know, I knew that I wanted the hats that he wears as the traveling outfit. Uh, this, yeah, that hat right there. I knew I wanted that. It's kind of boss of the planes. It's a very early shape of what was available for uh, cowboys, cowboy mm -hmm. hat in like 1870. And it's very practical, it's felt. Then, you know, the director kept mentioning a hat for him for his reading outfit. You know, I didn't really have the right shape for him during our one fitting and then we all went to Santa Fe. Luckily I found uh, this wonderful milliner there, uh, Ruby Rose Hat Company, she's unbelievable. And I said, okay, this is what looks good on Tom. You know, this is his head size. And she had a really great eye too. And I said, so can we make a hybrid like turned edge brim and maybe a shaped crown? She made me the hat, she delivered it. We're shooting the scene where he was going to wear it that night. Um, I, I get it, I take it into hair and makeup to Tom, I said, like, I got you a hat for the reading. <laughs> and he's like, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna wear a hat. Oh. So, um, okay. Um, <laughs> well, it's a really great hat. And so, it, you know, it's gonna be- in You were really room. pushing it. Mark Bridges was pushing it. This is like, how, this is sure? me pushing it. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I push it. But you'll see why I don't make a big deal about it because I know I have it. Okay, I have it if anybody mm. needs it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm good, I'm good. He can wear it, he can not wear it, it's fine. Right. Um, but we have it. Later that day, it's you know 10 o'clock at night, we're doing a scene, the director says "Oh, to Tom, okay, so it's, it's pouring because it's movie rain. Tom has to walk from a reading across the street to his hotel pouring rain. He looks at me and he goes, I think I'm going to need uh, this hat. <laughs> so I was like, okay, go get the hat from his room, bring it over to set, you know, and it's not like we're, our base camp is next to set. So I, the whole time I am like, oh, please, costume gods, please let this fit and look good because he has never had it on. Oh, because he never, when you brought it to him that that first moment, he's like, I don't think so. He didn't even put it on. Oh, Mark, Mark, what, this is, what, this is, what, how many costume gods were you um, kneeling to? At you the know, the, there's a set that kind of watch over me really all the time. <laughs> and they really watched over me on this one because he puts it on, he put it on and you see it later in the film when he, after his Dallas reading and stuff. So you see that it does look quite striking on him. But so I guess it's, you know, it, we were prepared because the director asked for it. Right. You don't just, you know, you, I listen between the lines is what I call it. You know, he mentioned it enough that made me think I needed to pay attention to it. <laughs> right. And so we did it and we needed it and it went on and it was great, but that's movie making. I mean, it's one foot in front of the other, every step of the way it's, you know, one step makes you make a certain choice. And then the next step makes you make a different choice. And so that's why you need a decent amount of prep time. And that's why 
you know, it's not all just here's the sketch and this is what it's going to be. It's constantly evolving. And that's why I'm constantly on set to be there for my actor and for my director as we establish these scenes. And uh, I don't, I learned that from Richard Hornung, the 10 films that I just, mm -hmm. you're there to establish and um, because you're making decisions all along the way. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, that, I think that um, that gives everybody a, a wonderful um, feeling of the film and the costumes and what goes through it and things that change things, you know, hats that, that uh, are, are, are originally thought about to be put on and then they don't, then they put up, you know, wonderful. Let's talk about some of your other amazing films. Some of the, let's go through some of the costume highlights of the wonderful Mark Bridges. Um, you know, it, I, I think that we can, you know, you've done such a great combination of historical clothing from, you know, 1920s and the artists and 1950s gowns, phantom thread, of course, the Joker that we see here. Um, and some of these photos actually just remind, I, I think all of them, in fact, are from our FIDM Art of Motion Picture Costume Exhibition. Uh, we, anytime there's, uh, you know, it's, it's usually the norm for some reason that if Mark Bridges has designed the costumes for a film, somehow it gets nominated and somehow it ends up at our exhibition. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's those costume gods, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. Let's start with Boogie Nights. Um, oh, you know, yeah. let's yeah, let's talk about Boogie Nights. Nineteen ninety-seven. Um, I think you were twelve at the time when you did the costume. <laughs> well, you costume. know, it was the second. It was Paul Thomas Anderson's second film. Oh, you can believe it! Wow. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, I I, I gotta say. This movie was a total labor of love. I was so excited when Paul gave me the script. I was like, I know this period. I know. <laughs> Even though I grew up on the East Coast, yeah, you know, I remember what I thought was cool. I remember which was really probably really tacky. Um, so I used that for Dirk, like what you think is cool at 17, you know, is not necessarily what you think is cool when you're 30. You know, right, right. Like he thought he was cool in that blue, you know, denim, you know, tuxedo suit. You know, like he's he's mm. he's he's pimping. That's my favorite. <laughs> but you're like, you know, you're actually not so cool. <laughs> yeah, um, that but was denim. Around, that suit was denim. It was brushed denim. Yeah, tux. It was a brushed denim tux. Dominic made that. I don't know if you remember Taylor Dominic, a town mm -hmm. Taylor here in town who just did a beautiful job. And I don't know whatever happened to that tux. Uh, you know, we, oh. gave everything, we gave everything to New Line because, but this was in the days before I think studios really wanted things for archives and things. So, oh, interesting, right. Yeah. So then what, what, in those days then it some, some sort of just went to the actors and some were, it, all went to new, it went to New Line. It went to New Line and some warehouse on the west side, and then I never knew what happened to it after that. Wow! Imagine that Dirk Diggler's blue, iconic blue tuxedo suit, costume designed by Mark Bridges. It's somewhere. It's out there. <laughs> it's out there. Next, let's talk about the artist. Oh. Uh, you won an Academy Award for Best Costume Design for the artist, black and white, 1920s film. Um, I, I remember speaking with you about this film because it was black and white and you you really enlightened me and I think the audience um, in terms of, you know, people would think, oh, it's so easy, it's black and white, but no, they're, they're different shades of, they're actual colors that work better with black and white, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, and Adrian talks about it too, or he did it too, where, you know, high contrast, you see uh, George at the top here, uh, you know, black and white, white tie and tails, um, your eye automatically goes to him. And, and you'll see that a lot in Adrian's work with contrasting stripes or real high contrast in his leading ladies. Also, um, I discovered that sequence or lame or beading or anything like that <clears throat> really has a lot of life to it. So I kind of use that as an indicator of 
that we were in a movie or it was a movie costume. Um, it's, it's subtle, but if you look back at the film, where the lames, where the beating, where the sequins come in, that's, it's all in the world of movies. Um, this orange dress here, that's what Pepe first meets uh, George in at, uh, outside of a theater. And I guess I just chose this color, this color combination. Oh, there was a thing. When we were making the artist, we never knew it was gonna blow up to be like best picture, okay? We were just doing a labor of love, $10 million film here in town with a French director and a French GP uh, self-finance film. Mm. So they wanted to keep their options open on who would see it. So uh, I had to keep in mind black and white, but also there are markets in the world that will not accept black and white movies. So there was a chance that it, in order to try to sell it, it could be shown in color. Wow. So that you had that on top. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I just did what I was going to do. And uh, and so this is what Peppy's change one was that color. And then she wears a mint green thing. But we also what I did basically was camera test. The art department made a color chart. I took a picture of it in color and then I took a picture of it in black and white. And you can see all the mid-tones, even if it's like distinctly in color, green, blue, pink, peach, they're all really distinct in color. You go to black and white and they're all the same. They're all the same. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah. You're so giving a lesson that any students, any students of film and TV costume right now, you're getting a, you're getting a, a, a lesson right here from Academy Award winning costume designer, Mark Bridges on, how to work with with black and white? Wow! I hope I hope people are taking notes. That that's um, just one of a kind. Thank you, Mark. Let's talk now. Let's move on to inherent vice. Yeah. Uh, 2015. Yeah. Uh, sexy psychedelic. Now, what I remember, I remember when I went back to research a little bit. It takes place in 1970, which yeah. I know. Basic. I know people think when they think that they think, oh, it's going to be you know hippy dippy. Uh, immediately, but it's 1970. You, it, it's still you're still talking the late 60s, fashion wise. Yeah. Um, right? Is that correct? I yeah, it is correct. And I love doing periods that are right on the cusp of a decade. You know, the master that I did for Paul was 1950, mm. and then this was 70. And uh, I love it because you can, you know. It, it's it's always kind of earlier, right? Um, with a, a whiff of things to come, so to speak. You a know? little, a little hint, a little hint yeah. of uh, somebody. I remember. I think I'm in some class. I must have taken back in the dinosaur days. That you know, when people say, when, if you want to categorize the look of a decade, you 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 usually want to start around the midway. So if you want to talk about the 70s, you you really want to look at 1975, 1976 as like when that sort of the, the, the fashion of that decade kind of came in or same thing with the 60s or 80s. You know, when you think of 80s, maybe 85, 86, that's where yeah. that's what we're talking about. Because when you look at like something from 1981, it still has kind of a, a 70s vibe, like a night, yeah. you know? Yeah, the Joker was kind of 80, 81. And it's, but I love being really unique. I mean, you know, I, I try to really hone in on that period. Um, but like uh, Reese's dress here that we made, uh, luckily I found some vintage double knits in the two colors that I wanted at ISW up in the attic. And, <laughs> uh, and Don at Warner Brothers made this for me. And it was something that is, it's in a catalog. It's, it's, but it was so cool to me that it could be a sleeveless dress, but then a coordinated jacket with right. And, and also the lengths were really interesting to me. I mean, it was really the time that even in business world, skirts were short. So, right. uh, you know, I don't know. It's just really interesting to me. It's always, uh, you're always trying to figure out the puzzle of a decade and how to make the look and how to speak about the people 
with their clothes. So, and, and try to be really specific about who they are. So, you know, uh, you got a challenge like that. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. That look that you're talking about the Reese with, it, it reminds me, um, uh, of, of somebody because they knew who we were, gave, uh, David and I a huge box of old Vogue pattern magazines from the late, from the mid sixties to the mid seventies. And that look right there just reminds me of, you know, one of those like Vogue patterns, like Valentino Garavani, 1969, you know, yeah, and you, you can, you can cut and make it home. All right. Speaking of period, Phantom Thread, uh, which you won also an Academy Award for Best Costume Design, 2018, Daniel Day-Lewis, he plays the London Couturier, the Savile Row Suits, you know, he was inspired, I think, by Norman Hartnell and, and Hardy Amy's, um, um, Alma, his muse, you know, you, you, you costumed her from, from being a, a fisherman's daughter to the stylish muse. Um, and these gowns, I know we had the lavender, the, the one above uh, in, in both of them in our exhibition that you can see yeah, right I there. I think you had all, all of them. Yeah, all of them. Yeah, all this of them is right all there. you, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know that you, you found this, uh, the, the lace, yeah. right? I think that yeah. you found that lace and you said, I, I must, I have, I will not stop until I use it. Is that? But actually, it was something that was written into the script that mm. that uh, Daniel's character had saved this piece of lace and he'd gotten it while he was in the war, and he mm. saved this piece of fabric. So it always started out as some kind of heirloom piece that he never had a piece. Uh, I never had a reason to use until Alma came. Came, right. So, it, it, there wasn't been... enough of a prodigious moment for him to use it until then. Yeah. So, so you know, it, it all came. I mean, everything that's right here, I can, you know, has a different story. And this is what I was saying about one foot in front of the other. I mean, the, the bottom right one with the magenta and the lace, you know, there was something from the teens that we'd gotten in Paris at a rental house that inspired me. Very different because it was like 1914 and this is 1955. So, uh, but that inspired me for this dress. But then, you know, I want to carry through the woodcock collar. So you see that collar on the wedding dress in the movie. You see that collar here, you know you're trying to put a stamp of an imaginary person on these clothes. Also this other strange dress to the left, <laughs> um, you know, was something that came about like uh, Paul wanted, Paul Thomas Anderson wanted Daniel to be involved with the prep and, and designing things. So we pressed Daniel to like, oh, well, do you have any thoughts about what this first dress could be like. And he did kind of a stick figure mm -hmm, drawing right. and kind of verbally explained it to us. And then it was up to me and the brilliant Cecile Van Dyke, who was my cutter, figure out exactly how to make that into a wearable garment. You know, his turn um, his stick figure croquis, Daniel Day Lewis's stick figure croquis into, like you said, just bringing it. You, to, to creation. Yeah. Uh, so that's fun. Give, that's like I say, give me a challenge and right. I'll figure it out for you. But, and then, you know, then the one above it, that was the lace one. Uh, but then you figure like, how, what shape do we use? How do we, what style do we do it in that, that uh, makes the most of the lace. I think Daniel, we brought Daniel a book of satins and I was like, here, why don't you pick a color for this? Mm. So that's, so he feels authorship as he was acting with it, interacting with it. Right, right, know, right. Uh, there's an authorship to it, but also he's got a huge job in front of the camera. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take it away and make it happen. You know what I mean? So right, right. We were collaborating. It was mostly Daniel and I. I think, you know, I would get Paul on the weekends or something and be able to bring him to the workroom and show him what was up, you know? You did such a sublime job. I have to say, you know, um, 
it, it, the clothes whispered. They didn't shout. You know, you thought, oh, I'm going to go see a fashion movie or I'm going to go see. It wasn't that. I mean, obviously, because the, the film was so much about other, you know, there was so much else, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, in the in the film. But the clothes, they, 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 you know, they reminded me of those old London couturiers. They weren't, they weren't, at, you know, they weren't avant-garde. They were, they were ladylike. They yeah. were for a certain age woman, not trendy. You know, you go to uh, Scaparelli or Dior or, you know, somebody else for, for that. This was more, you know, I can give you, you know, proper ladylike London ballroom party. And that's, you know, that's, that's what these were. Yeah, and, and you did a great seamless job of, of doing that. While gorgeous, they didn't take away from the film. So it wasn't, you know, it, it didn't, it, Phantom Thread was not a, necessarily a, a, a movie about fashion. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you did a thank great job. You. All right, let, thank yeah, you. go ahead. No, thank you for that. It's funny you say that about the dresses because at some point, Paul Thomas Anderson, we were looking at the scene where she wears this pink and, and maroon dress. And Paul was like, you know, basically you look at those newsreels and all the women are wearing pretty much the same dress. Right. So, uh, and so that was cool for this scene because this stood out in a way that may or may not have been successful. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, Joker, let's get to Joker. I know oh, yeah. we have a lot of fans of mm -hmm. uh, the film and, uh, you know, I know that you, you know, the, 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 you relied a lot heavily, you know, interesting, clashing color palettes, you know, talk about those colors, the dark, the light. Um, I know, uh, I, I found it fascinating when you described that, um, that red clown suit uh, and, and how originally it was, I think, supposed to be another color uh, or a terracotta perhaps. And then the look of it, because of who he was, that, um, Joaquin uh, Phoenix's character that he that this you wanted the suit to be dated on um, look the the silhouette the lapels perhaps talk a little bit about that and these are details that people just don't don't get and I love that that what you you put into the details Mark that you put into the thought that you put into the garment um, that's why we love um, listening to you you know explaining those things. Yeah, and you know, again, one foot in front of the other. I mean, uh, you know, it's fortuitous. Thank you, costume gods. That <laughs> that red suit and that combination and everything worked out as well as it did, and is iconic like that. Because, you know, you can't sit down and go like, oh, what could I, what could I do, that's gonna be classic forever. You know, it's like one foot in front of the other. It's like, okay, I got a story. I got a guy who owns a three-piece suit that he probably had since high school or one time he bought it for a wedding. So let's find a prototype shape. I always love a, seek, I always love a single breasted peak. I found a 70s suit that had some weird pocket details. Um, I had wanted to... There were actually three versions of the suit made. It started out kind of more of a maroon that he wore for his comedy stand-up act. And then I, there was one in the middle red between this and the Joker suit that I was, had, um, had made up exactly the same uh, for his, when he visits his mom's grave at the cemetery, which I don't mm. think ended up in the final film. And then the third one is when he pulls this on and becomes a Joker. Like the color, my idea was, is that the color uh, sort of reflects what's going on in his mind. In his mind, right. The best laid plans of mice and men kind of thing. The middle one gets cut out. Um, and you never see all three pieces when he does his stand up. But, uh, but the waistcoat for the Joker is from his clown outfit at the beginning. When the happy, the happy, happy the clown one, right. Yeah, when he gets beat up. So you understood that he got that from someplace and also uh, the necktie that he wore to his mother's funeral was from his clown outfit. Um, the shoes, I just thought the shoes were cool. 
and they've become part of the iconic. But, and I don't mean these red ones, I mean the brown ones that we had that are patent that he was wearing mm -hmm. upstairs. We had those made because I had a prototype that were leather, but Joaquin is vegan. Is vegan, so right. We, we made a pair of shoes at like the Broadway shoe maker out of uh, non-animal product shoes. So, uh, which no problem for me, not the first time that I've done it. Also a lot of these colors, you know, and Todd, I asked Todd Phillips, the director, do you want to go from bright to dark or do you want to go from dark to bright? And he said, dark to bright. So, and then also that shirt, that green shirt, mm -hmm. you know, I could imagine that he had it in his wardrobe. Yeah. Um, I don't have to explain everything, you know, it's a movie, but again, I thought it was cool. I thought it was a cool pattern. I thought it was a cool color. Um, I actually, and I copied a prototype that I found that I just actually saw still out at a rental house right now, actually. <laughs> the shirt that inspired me to have this silk screen and everything is still yeah. out there for rent. Wow, um, wow. Yeah, it's interesting how all these things come up. And I never <laughs> use white socks, but I thought if there was ever a time to wear white socks, it was gonna be this guy. <laughs> uh, and then the, the production designer gave, brought this really cool book that was uh, done in the late 70s. And it was taking photos of 70s muscle cars at night in urban areas. And that's where the color combinations came from. We were really inspired by this book for you know the rust against the purple that he wears or these odd kind of ochre jackets and things right kind of like, so like a corvette you're thinking yeah of exactly or like al camino or something right that were in these 70s colors and uh so that's where the rest of my palette kind of came from great well thank you so much mark let's um, uh, you know, we, God, it's gone, we've gone so fast. We've almost done with the hour, but let's get to some of our questions from the attendees. One of the most popular, are you ready for this, Mark? I'm ready. Okay, okay. I'm ready. Uh, one of the most popular questions is how does an aspiring designer find their way into the industry? Can you uh, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? I can't, I can't hear you. Oh, hello. No, I can't. Oh, okay, perfect. Yes, can you, um, again, the question, aspiring, how does an aspiring designer find their way into the industry? You know, uh, you know, I, I can only speak from my own experience, which was, you know, I went the education route. It's not for everybody. It's a different time. Um, but I think getting in there, you know, I'm actually mentoring somebody uh, right now. And, you know, I think it's, it's get prepared, like, do, look at these things, learn as much as they can from people like you. Um, and, and get, you try to get your foot in the door, even if it's uh, PAing or interning or something, because I think um, cream rises to the top, so to speak. Like if you're good and, and you're reliable and you're into it and you have your can do attitude and can do anything, I think people notice that and want to help you and want to bring you along too. Right. So that's my experience. That's how I react to people. You can see like, wow, you know, we asked some, so-and-so to do something, we sure they really came back with the goods, you know. They did, right, they really came back. And, and you know, to let everybody know, of course, obviously, if you don't know, we here at FIDM, we've, we have a wonderful, amazing film and TV costume design department. So if you're interested in studying that and, and being a future Mark or Marquetta Bridges, uh, you could, uh, you know, go through the program and, you, and there's so much education that you can learn there. And we also have wonderful uh, connections uh, through the Career Center as well. Um, and like I said, we have, if, you know, when we go back uh, post pandemic and, and, and regain the, the fabulous exhibitions that we have, you know, where you can meet these, these wonderful designers, I think that that, that would be great. Um, uh, another question, let's see. Um, 
Uh, what are the major challenges you have faced in costume design? Um, I, and then on the other note, what are the most enjoyable parts of costume designing for bigger films? Okay. And this is from Kaylee. Hey, Kaylee. Um, the challenges probably, you know, trying to deliver the goods in a timely fashion uh, for the amount of money that they want to spend and being satisfied with the end result for me being satisfied with the end result, what we're doing, you know, just because you have some obstacles, you can't let down, you know? And then what was the second part? So that's my biggest challenge. I mean, I have often sat in front of the calendar looking at boom, boom, big scene, big scene, big scene, big scene, right. saying like, I, I don't know how we're going to do this. I really, <laughs> but somehow it gets done. You know, it just does because you buckle down and you focus and, and you make it happen. But what was the second part of that question? Oh, I think, satisfying? Uh, uh, satisfying. What gets, yes, yeah, yeah. What, what, what are some of the most enjoyable parts of costume signing, especially mm -hmm. for bigger films? Yeah, you know, I think that's when all this planning and the fitting and the talking with the director and the, you know, production designer and everything, and you go to set and it's, it's all there and and you look at the monitor and it looks great and you're like oh wow <laughs> i love it you know and you're so pleased and proud that like all that thought and interaction and work and finding and stress whatever uh, is actually paying off and and i see them do a few shots and then i go and get ready for the next day um but with a good sense of satisfaction and more excitement about the project ready for tomorrow, you know? Wonderful. Okay, Luella wants to know, when you're having custom fabric woven for you to match historical fabric, is that a niche thing? Is it more a, a small artisan you're sourcing from or larger yeah. companies that yeah. will weave that small batch of yardage for you? Yeah, Good no, it's, question. A, it's a smaller place. And I use the same place like 12, 13 years ago for Daniel J. Lewis's suit in There Will Be Blood, his gray suit. And then we needed like, oh, I'm gonna have to call them to get some fabric done <laughs> again. And it, and they'll work with you. Yeah, I didn't need a whole, you know, lines worth of fabric. I just needed enough to make a half a dozen coats. So yeah, it's more of a small workshop who does business with film people so they know the timing. They know, right. What's the typical, uh, Lauren wants to know, what's the typical time frame that you, you that you normally have? It might depend, I guess you will maybe answer that, um, to, to have your costumes uh, made. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, every film's different, uh, you know, and also you're kind of, you're kind of prioritizing what works first, you know, I had like did a film this summer and I had like four and a half weeks prep. Okay, mm. but we were constantly making throughout for things, you know, we I was still establishing people on day 65. So, <laughs> you know, you're making that. Sometimes I have 12 weeks. I think I had 12 weeks for News of the World, maybe 14 weeks for Joker, you know, it, it's it varies it varies so it varies and i'm you sure you're like still two, making three weeks you know you're still to, making costumes while the film is being done oh, right oh, oh yeah because the, even the casting isn't even done i'm it may be day 25 and i won't know they won't cast a guy who's working on day 35 until then. wow okay so you yeah. don't even know all right let's wrap it up one final question what is this is a biggie mark are you uh -oh. ready for this one <sighs> yeah i know okay here we go here we go. Um, what is a skill you think is vital for being a costume designer for movies? Mm -hmm. okay. I told you. I told you. Ooh, wow. I know. I, I know. Sixty-five thousand dollar question. You know, I, I, I think it's being sort of quick on your feet and also easy to work with. You know, there's the easy to work with kind of thing, like uh you're gonna have to and and having being a little bit egoless about things you know you're there because somebody wrote the script you're there because the director wanted you you're there but you have to satisfy a whole bunch of people and so you have to be easy to work with you have to be adaptable you have to be a collaborator 
I think, I think if you're able to weave your way through a lot of different personalities and a lot of different situations and money constraints and time constraints, uh, that, that is a huge talent and will aid you immeasurably. There you go. $65,000 question answered. Cool. <laughs> Everybody, let's give a big, big virtual applause to the man, Mr. Mark Bridges, two-time Academy Award-winning costume designer. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thank uh, you it's so been, I mean, I already, you, you had me at hello many years ago, and, and now it's, it's like, it, uh, I mean, we got, we got to do Drake soon. <laughs> it was really fun. It was really fun. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Good luck with everything. And, and thank you again for, um, for making this, this time um, wonderful for us and for teaching and mentoring and educating us and inspiring us and bringing your passion through um, here at our FIDM lecture series at Costume Designer, you you are an inspiration. So thank you, thank you Mark. Thank you so much, and so are you. Thanks, everybody. I'm gonna go. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, this was a wonderful conversation. Please join us for our upcoming FIDM virtual events.